getting a record time. Check one, two. There we go. It is now by the clock on the wall, 1215. We were set for noon. I apologize for delay getting going. Uh, I'm Paul Holman. I'm the chair of the Public Safety Committee on the Assembly. And with me today are my colleagues. Dick Draney, I thought you remember. Yeah. Harriet Drummond, Assembly Member. I'm not a member of this committee, but I'm very interested in the topic. And so, it's just a formality in case you by chance don't know who we are. Uh, I do know that we have a sign-in sheet up here in the corner of the table where, near where Ms. Engel is sitting from the Health Department. Ms. Diane Engel is the Director of Health and Human Services for the Municipality. Also, we have with us, if you wouldn't mind, just identify yourself and which department you represent. Oh, I'm Diane Engel, Director of the Department of Health and Human Services. Chris Kaczynski, Water Waste Water Utilities. Richard Steffel, Water Waste Water Director of Treatment. Christy Kate is our legislative aide, and she's going to be taking some notes as well. And I believe we have some folks here we'll identify as we go along. I have currently on the list here folks that would like to talk or at least give us available for some question and answers potentially. Uh, Mr. Ward Burler, are you here? Okay. Uh, Chief Medical Officer, Director, Alaska Division of Public Health. Delissa Culpepper, are you in the audience? Okay. Ms. Culpepper is the chair of the Alaska Dental Action Coalition. Mary Willier. Okay, uh, DDS, a dental health aid therapist, education director with the Alaska Natal Tribal Health Consortium. Troy Ritter. Okay, Troy Ritter is Lieutenant Commander, Applied Sciences Manager, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium Division of Environmental Health and Engineering. Patrick Luby. Very good. And Mr. Luby is Advocacy Director for AARP Alaska. Uh, Nicolette Bennett. I think you go by Nikki, right? Yes. Nikki Bennett is uh, the uh, Health Alaska State Dental Hygienist Association. Uh, Dr. Timothy Thomas, Very good. Uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention Investigations Program, Jim Toll, and he is the Alaska Dental Society uh, Chairman and Front Executive Director. Executive Director. Okay, I know that uh, Jason Agri, I recognize Mr. Agri here, and I believe you've had some folks that, uh, did you have anybody from your, your program or uh, your policy to introduce that might be given to us? Yeah, I have Brady right here. Okay. Joe Prince Yoda. Well, there are very few people who associate with me. <laughs> <laughs> very good. You know, we, have, we have John Yoon right here. We have a little on. He wants to make a presentation. Okay. Is there anybody else in the audience not identified that would like to either comment or give statement or testimony to this committee about fluoride? And yourself? I'm uh, Dr. Tom Kopoleski. I'm the dental director at the Alaska Navy Medical Center. Anyone else? Barb Linderman, I'm just a concerned citizen. Very good. We do have uh, Ms. Uh, Sarah Softshaw Cohn from Dentex, uh, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium on the phone. Ms. Cohn, are you there? Sarah? I am good. Okay, very good. Also, there's a gentleman from Girdwood, I believe, Evan Cutler, who may be calling in around the 1230 hour or a little later, and we'll have him uh, on the phone. He wants to talk about it. Yes. Um, I got an email this morning from uh, Roman Romanovsky, um, but I didn't have time to print the statement and bring it with me. He was not able to be here for the trial, so if you do declare that. Okay, very good. All right, so with that said, uh, we're here discussing uh, what's in the municipal code, uh, 26.40.050, which specifically authorizes and directs the utility director to put fluoride in the water up to 1.3 parts per million or milliliter. Um, and again, this is subject matter testimony from the department that will be able to give us more answers uh, to any questions we may have and explain. So, Mr. Edry, uh, you have been before this body, the assembly anyway, uh, many times speaking on the fluoride matter and municipalities drinking water. So I'd ask that you might uh, start, if you would, to share us your concerns. And what we'd like to hear is some suggested solutions. So there's a concern of yours, a problem, if you will, and a suggested solution to that. So if you would please, if you begin. Now, again, I ask you to be a little respectful. Uh, no Gettysburg address, if possible, if you can try to be succinct. Very good. All right. Um, basically, sorry, Sam. Okay. Um, let me read uh, a couple of things. Basically, this, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has now acknowledged the findings of many human dental. Researchers that the mechanism of fluoride's main benefit is direct from surface application and not from ingestion. And uh, also, uh, 
fluoride is unethical because it's a water supply because it's individuals are not asked for their informed consent. And <coughs> prior to the medication, and that's standard practice for the administration of all other medications. And uh, I would like to uh, yield my time back to the body and hear the smart people. So I would like to respond, be more responding. This is not me that wants to put the fluoride in the water. It's uh, people here and uh, people in the state and uh, health organizations that want to keep it in the water. Well, I may have missed this, and I apologize. Uh, we have been putting fluoride in the Anchorage drinking water through Bay Wound since, and this training is going back to 1992. Does the department have? We believe it's late or uh, late 60s is what we've been using. Recording in the water too, though. Absolutely. How many parts per day? We dose it about 1.1 parts per million. So there's two chemicals going to the water: fluoride and chlorine. There's a disinfectant. There's the chlorine. And there's a fluoride that's added to Thank you. Um, so the 60s? We believe so. We were trying to check it and get information. We couldn't get it all the way back to where we could pin it down. But we believe it's late 60s. Late 90s the last time this issue came in front of us. Ms. Crum? Um, I, I think, Mr. Chair, a little background on the fluoridation program would be in order first before we heard the rest of the testimony. Okay, I, 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 I think I think it's an issue that it's difficult to trace the start of, of fluoridation, um, keeping records on stuff like that. I think is pretty critical where it involves public health and dosages and that sort of thing. I get that. I just as I challenged each speaker if they could, uh, particularly if you're raising a challenge to a problem, if you could identify. A speaker. I may have missed it. I apologize. I would like to rephrase it. Question. Yes, sir. Well, not, not a question. I'm asking if you could give a suggested solution to the problem that, as you see it. I cannot suggest any solution other than pure water. So you, you're suggesting discontinuing adding fluoride to the anchorage drinking water? Is dissolving completely. Uh, so the chlorine. How about the chlorine we added to water? Would that well, be discontinued too? The, the fluoride is added to treat water to basically kill it. The organism like so that's acceptable. Sporty, uh, but the fluoride is added specifically to treat the citizens. And there's two different there's basically two different uh, items here, the chlorine and the fluoride. But does chlorine go to the drinkers too? Well the chlorine goes to the drinkers too, but at least you can filter it out pretty inexpensively uh, with a with the uh, activated charcoal filter. But they're totally two totally different Items really because water is put in as a medicine, as a drug to treat people, and chlorine is put in to basically kill the organisms and keep the water uh, safe enough for drink. And, and, and doesn't chlorine evaporate? I mean, if you if you pour the water and let it sit for a while for several days, doesn't it evaporate as opposed to the fluoride, which is a Chemical, a, a powder that I believe is added to the water. Is that just a question to me? Yes. Yeah. It, it, it does have a uh, natural. It, it will degrade over time and, and aerate. You're talking chlorine. Or chlorine or? will. Um, our experience is it takes quite a while out here with our temperature. It tends to uh, accelerate in warmer water, warmer weather. So our experiments is that the chlorine does not dissipate very fast at all. And is, the, and is the chlorine provided as gas or as a as a um, metal a powder? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in the water system today that, that we do. We have gone away from gas, and it is all sodium hypochlorite that we generate on site, and it's but it's closer to call it a, a type of bleach almost. It, it, yeah, it, it's generated. It's a liquid sodium hypochlorite. Okay, and, we're and, away from the gas. And di and and in the floor in respect to the fluoride, didn't the recommended dosage change sometime recently, yes. as recommended by the powers that be? Uh, I'm fine. Yeah, it, it was recently in 2011. The recommendation was to cut the uh, the dosage from one point or excuse me, 0.7 milligrams per liter to 1.3. No, yeah. from 1.3. Right, right. There, there was a range that was 0.7 to 1.3 was optimal. And at 2011, I believe it was January or early in 2011, the recommended dosage was not to exceed 0.7 milligrams per liter. 
So it went from a range to a not to exceed. Okay. Interesting. Yes. Thank you. And was there reason or basis for single or? I, I think the EPA um, altered its recommendation. I'm not an expert, but on that, but um, I do know that we that AWW. One second here. I'm, I'm going to get a baseline here so we can get control of how we're going to testify in this uh, matter. Uh, Mr. Agri, you've kept it very succinct. I appreciate that. Um, it's almost as if we're in this question and answer. Uh, I, I, it's adversarial enough. It's a contentious issue. I get it. We, we want to get informed and educated. So I, I would ask that perhaps one of your other speakers, uh, maybe perhaps Paul, for a succinct yes, ma'am, please. Yeah. Introduce yourself, please, and tell us. Uh, hi, my name is Pradeep Prater, and uh, first I want to thank everyone for taking up the subject. It's, it is very important. Um, I'm a wife, I'm a mother of two girls, and I have a chronic medical condition, which began at the age of three, that I cannot yet prove, but I believe was caused either wholly or in large part by exposure to fluoridated water. When I was a child, my parents had no idea of the connection between fluoride and hypothyroidism. But today, what fluoride does to the thyroid is very well documented, and it is readily available to anyone that wants to wear more of such a Fluoride is so effective at reducing thyroid production that until the 1970s, it was actually used to treat hyperthyroidism or overactive. Last year, on the subject, the U.S. Department of Health lowered the recommended level of fluoride in water by 41%, and that's nearly half of what they used to recommend, stating adverse health effects as the only reason for the lowering of that recommendation. Fluoride is known to cause not only dental fluorosis and hypothyroidism, but we know that it lowers IQ in children, it impairs fertility, it exacerbates and may actually cause kidney disease and some cancers, irritable bowel syndrome, eczema, headaches, osteoporosis, and it might cause fibromyalgia. There's a longer list than that. That's just what I decided to mention. So we have to ask ourselves how many Anchorage residents suffer from these conditions and how many of them suffer from it as a direct result, or are their conditions exacerbated as a result of the fluoride that we put in <coughs> The Fairbanks Fluoride Task Force was made up of two chemists, one geochemist, one dental surgeon, one microbiologist, and one pediatrician. For one year, they did extensive research on the subject. And at that time, they uh, submitted a report to the city of Fairbanks reporting, uh, recommending that they immediately stop water fluoridation. I have copies of that report, if anyone would like copies of that. But referencing page six, item three, and I quote, all of the members of the task force went into this project with incomplete and in some cases incorrect information about the issue. We suspect that we are not unique in that respect, end quote. So what they're saying is that they discovered facts about fluoride were not what they had been led to believe. And we need to remember that that task force included a dentist and a pediatrician and they said every member of the task force was wrong about the subject. What fluoride does to the human body is irrefutable. It is a dangerous toxin that is known to cause dozens of health conditions, even in very low doses. We fluoridate hoping to protect kids from cavities, but that is not worth the damage that we know we are doing, especially to non-nursing infants and to those of us who are ultra sensitive. We need to understand that fluoride is a medication. It is not an essential nutrient. There's no such thing as fluoride deficiency. 
nor is it actually truly necessary to achieve good dental health. Knowing all of this makes medicating the entire population of Anchorage with a prescription drug absolutely unethical, no matter what the reason. Fluoridating water is as logical as adding sun fog to the water supply. Both substances are only beneficial when used topically, but if added to the water, su uh, water supply, sunblock would eventually make contact with the skin when you bathe, thus protecting you from UV rays that it would damage you internally. This is what we do with fluoride, it's the same thing, as if it's not a dangerous neurotoxin. In the 1930s, fluoride was grandfathered in, and the FDA has never approved any fluoride product for ingestion because of one simple reason. It is unsafe to ingest. Right now, there's over 250,000 Cambridge residents that are literally being medicated without their consent through the manipulation of a life essential element, our water. I'm not asking that fluoride be outlawed. Let those who want it have it, but by choice. Kodiak, Juno, Fairbanks, and Palmer have all stopped water fluoridation. And it's time for Anchorage to also put an end to the practice. Please stop fluoridating our water. Thank you. Quick, quick question uh, myself, but I'll start with Ms. Drummond. She just raised her hand. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is a question for AWWU. How many residents does AWWU serve with its water of the total population of Anchorage, which is roughly 290,000? There's our customer accounts, about 55,000 accounts. And based on that, uh, we estimate we're serving about 250,000. That sounds a little I'm aware of, and in, in the interest of disclosure, I live in a uh, rather large well system in Spinard that serves about 100 properties. Um, we think about 400 people, four or 500 people, um, that has never been fluoridated. The well has existed since the 1950s. There are a number of wells of that size uh, throughout the system, and there are many, many homes on the hillside and other rural parts of Anchorage that have wells with no treatment um, whatsoever. Um, and it's my understanding, without a um, demographer, Mr. Chair, in the municipal staff, uh, it's difficult to estimate how what, is, what the average number of, of residents per household is. Uh, as a former school board member, we had a figure of roughly 2.3 folks per household. So at 55,000, 2.3 is uh, uh, not even 150,000 people. So I would appreciate some more accurate numbers in terms of how many residents AWWU's water serves as accurate as you can come to that at some point. Of course, the FDA's website, uh, AWWU services 250 some odd thousand people at least two What date was that number? From the FDA, because I'm talking about the, the census that put our current population at 291,000 approximately. Oh, okay. The uh, recent census. Yes. And my guess is that FDA's numbers do not include the recent yes, census. Yes, they may not, but that's all that I had access to, so that's, that's why I use that. Thank you. Well, at this time, we need to, I guess, stipulate something. I think it's a good question or request this drummond for the utility if it's possible, but I, I've got. I, I gather that it's rather difficult whether you get a house house survey or use the census data. Um, if they ask that question, you know, how many people drink water out of your tap? I guess. Uh, that's one thing that needs to be clarified. We may serve 55,000 accounts. If you took the average household of 2.3 based on that, it would be somewhere around 125,000. But there are a number of schools, um, you know, where we're serving the residents of Anchorage water in a public location, whether it's a business, school, park. So that's where we. Right. There may be a disconnect as to the number of residents of households served water in Anchorage, which would be probably closer to the 2.3 times mm -hmm. versus the number of residents of Anchorage that they consume AWW water. So you're saying like Providence Hospital, uh, there, you know, a school may have 
400 children in there that Our some of those are not on city I, water. I, I have an idea. I have an idea. Condo building and apartment housing. Right. That, okay. So it's a difficult number to take. But between the data collected by our property tax division, which can tell you exactly how many single family homes, how many apartments, how many duplexes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then some, by some kind of cross tabulation of those figures, you should be able to come up with a number. And I think that is something that the health department perhaps might want to address, Mr. Chair, but I think we need to have a number at some point, because there's a significant number of people in this community that do not buy water from AWW, my uh, community included, which is in the heart of Spinar. And there are dozens of private wells in my neighborhood and all along Chester Creek, and I know various other creeks in this, uh, in this community. So we need a number, and I appreciate your number, but I believe it's high. Mr. Drain, just an owner before Rich Wall 40, the water, even though that part of your water system they have no formation system for both bases. So uh, we're looking at how many people are getting far, it's not just the sequence of anchors. It's also a number of farm ranch. That's why we need a number. That's why we need a number. One person is too many. There you go. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I'm just speaking for myself. Not <laughs> the other. We're taping and I don't know if you signed it. Can you just give us your name, please? Oh, it's Kathy Kincaid. K I N C A I D. C A I D, yes. And I was born in Anchorage. And um always had fluoride in my water and I have um, major health issues. I have MS, diabetes, arthritis, osteoporosis, um, psoriasis, that's not even all of them. Um, I don't have an appendix, tonsils, or a gallbladder and I am allergic a lot of things, chlorine being one of them, I can't go into a pool with chlorine in it. I take a lot of medications, and I don't want to take even one more that hasn't been prescribed to me. I don't know how much fluoride may have affected my health to push these diseases along. I can't take any of the drugs that would stop the progression of MS because I'm allergic to all of them. My doctor never prescribed fluoride for me or chlorine. I don't want them in my water. Are you an AIM customer? Oh, I sure I am. I, I what part of town do you live in? I live in the Pierce subdivision uh, on 70th, off of Arctic, down by Diamond. And you lived there for? I lived there for 20 years. Five years. <coughs> I lived in Muldoon, where I was also a customer of Anchorage Water Wastewater Utility. Thank you so much. Um, and one follow-up question, Ms. Brady. Uh, your data that you used, is, is there a way to get, to get us a copy, maybe with our legislative aid here, of the data that you used and where it was from? If you know yes. Do you know right up the top of your head? Where you, are you collecting from different sources? There are many different sources. So you'll be able to give that to Ms. Kate and Not today. I have to no, that's fine. If you okay. can get it to, we'll get your yes. information. Or you, if it's signed I'll in. I can back up everything I said. Okay, great. Anything, Mr. I saw a couple hands go up. Ms. Bennett, I know uh, I'm calling you first since you had raised your hand. I recognize. Is there anyone that would be able to respond or, or at least give a statement on behalf of the fluoride that's in the water at this time? Well, I'd like to first state, I'm really sorry that either one of you are going through any kind of health problems, but there have been no definitive points um, between fluoride and thyroid disease and all these. There's possible links. That's like saying somebody who lives in a majority community has a risk for cancer. Well, anybody who lives in a community has a risk for cancer. There's no actual definitive causation of fluoride causing cancer or some of these other diseases, it's just a possibility. Um, but same for the sun. Now are you same for the air. Are you speaking of the Alaska State Dental Hygienist Association? Correct. Are you authorized to speak? What is the position of your association on fluoride? We are a fluoride fluoridation. At what level? The point seven. And the reason why they reduced it was because there are so many other outside sources of fluoride that you can't account for what other sources people are getting from. Um, juices, sodas, 
even canned vegetables and fruits will have, you know, fluoride in them if they were produced in a fluoride community. So they lowered it because they didn't want to put it in too much. And it was to account for that. Um, what kind of medical professional deals with uh, thyroid diseases? Would that be an endocrinologist? Do we have any endocrinologists in the room today? Mr. Chair, I suggest at some point in time in this fluoride discussion we ask the professional opinion of an endocrinologist related to thyroid diseases. Um, I saw another hand in the back of the room speak on the matter, I believe. Okay. I'll speak, but I didn't raise my hand. Please. All right. Um, my name is Daryl Lanzon, D-L-A-N-Z-O-N. First of all, I apologize for how I'm dressed. You see me at other meetings wearing a tie and dress more appropriately, but this is in the middle of the day when a lot of people are working, and I'm actually going to go back to work. This should be at night so more people can participate. You said 100 people. Well, guess what? A lot of those people are working right now. More people would have been here. I know myself of at least 10 more people that would have showed up to oppose the poison in our water. This is a human rights issue. None of you people that I know of have a medical license to give me fluoride. It's my right to not have that medicine. Okay. Right. Can I get your name, sir? Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L, last name L-A-N-Z-O-N. Like I said, there is, you have no right to do that. Uh, to address the hygienist, they say it's okay to put it in the water, yet the American Dental Association themselves says direct application is the most effective. So there's a, there's a difference there. The fluoride that is being put in our water is sodium fluoride. It is a, it's a hazardous waste. It is a neurotoxin. It is not calcium fluoride that occurs naturally in some groundwater. There's a big difference between a neurotoxin and something that is naturally occurring. On top of that, there is a difference between pharmaceutical grade of anything and industrial waste. These are major differences, and I, I encourage anybody to look this up. You know, I've spoke about this before, and I, I also want to apologize that I'm not as prepared as I wanted to be when we had spoke, and I talked to you about the numbers of people that I got to sign the petition that I had um, because I've been involved in, 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 a, in a legal matter that's taken up quite a bit of my time. Um, in 2010, the American Dental Association themselves recommended this. They re recommended that if you use Similac formula for babies, that you don't use fluoridated water. There's a reason for it, because non-breastfeeding children, babies, are most affected by the poison that they put in our water. It affects the central nervous system, it calcifies the pineal gland in the brain. It is not good. I told you I had a list of 50 reasons. I brought that with me to turn in. I also brought in the list of about 100 people that, whose names I gathered in about 90 minutes in front of City Hall. I told you that I could get a lot more had I had time, and I know I can. This is a matter for the public to decide. This isn't a matter for a group of people to decide that they have the right to medicate. That's what the FDA calls it. This is a medication. I don't have a prescription for fluoride. I don't think anybody in this room has a prescription for fluoride. I don't want a prescription for fluoride, and this comes down to bottom line, human rights, individual rights, constitutional rights. You don't have the right to medicate me without my permission, and that's exactly what you're doing. I have a bottle of water right here that comes from your taps that I have to put boron in to take the poison out in order to drink it, because I can't afford to buy bottled water all the time. But I can take it out, I know enough how to get that poison out of my water, I know enough how to get it out of my body, and I continue to do it. You see it's a little cloudy, that's because I have to put lemon in my water, which I don't mind, but in order to get that little taste that tastes like baking soda out of the water, that's what you have to do. I recommend you all do it, because you are being poisoned against your will. I can ask any, answer any questions you have, you want to throw at me, I appreciate that someone would have to throw a tough one at me. But actually, back to your numbers, actually, that Ms. Drummond brought up the numbers. Um, it doesn't matter if it's 5,000 people, a million people, it's still against their constitutional rights to be medicated, bottom line. 
If you want to get fluoride, go buy some Crest toothpaste with fluoride and rub it all over your teeth. I'm 42 years old. I've never had a cavity in my life. Guess what? I don't fluoride. It's negligible. It doesn't have any effect one way or the other. In, country, in, in countries in Europe where they have added fluoride to the water and then taken it out, there's been no difference. Our native population, as an example, has been massively fluoridated. And I will tell you, and I don't mean this as, as any slight against them, there are plenty, many of them, that have terrible teeth. If fluoride was so good for them, why aren't their teeth good? If fluoride was so bad for me, not so good for me to have, why don't I have a single cavity? Look, none. I'm not lying. Zero. I don't have them. I brush my teeth with peroxide and baking soda. I do it myself. I don't even buy toothpaste. I mix it myself and I brush it. I have nice, clean, white teeth. Nothing to do with fluoride. Mr. Drummond had a question for me. Yes, thank you. I want to thank you for coming, Mr. Lanson. Thank you. Um, this is this is a committee meeting. We're just beginning to investigate this whole fluoride issue, and we want to do some fact finding before we bring it to the level of a public hearing. Um, I, I agree with you. It's hard for people to make it during the day when they're working, but um, that's the problem with all these professionals in the room. They they're working, and um, others are not. It, you know, it will get. It, it may very well get to the level at which it will be heard at a regular assembly meeting, which, as you know, starts at 5 p.m. Right. And I just heard you wanted me to bring the, yes. the list that I got of people to sign. Yes, if you could give that to Ms. Kane, I'd appreciate it. So she can have the. Uh, we're, we're taking all the documentation. Anybody else want to sign against poison in your water? Uh, also, I thought about something else that should, people should look into is apoptosis. I don't know if anybody's familiar with what that is. But apoptosis is related to fluoride, and one of the things that you'll notice, as most of you are at least my age or older, when we were in high school, girls were not developed like they are now. There's a big difference, and it should be noticeable to anybody in this room that you can see an 11-year-old girl that is, excuse my language, stacked. And that is related to apoptosis, and I encourage you all, Google it. Wikipedia will tell you enough about it, as terrible as, it, as the source as that is. Can you tell us how to spell that, please? A P O P. I have written down T O S I S. Okay, thank you. And I believe. Sir, so the other thing is, I know you had the documentation. I'll ask the same question I asked Ms. Pretty. Are there sources that you are referring to to get the information that you have? There's lots of sources. And are you able to provide that? Are you able to provide that? To I can provide you all kinds of links. We appreciate all it. Kinds of I was actually there. working. I, I was telling. Like after we had the meeting at the last assembly, sure. I my intention was to send you all an email so I could give you access to the stuff that I have. And if you choose, like I was spoke to Mr. Trombley at that meeting about, sure. and I have started an email, but I just haven't had time because I've been writing 25 pages of testimony. Yeah. You know, so I really haven't been able to get to that, to take up all my free time. But I had every intention of sending all of you, you know, the access at least to the same information that I have. So if you could get to Ms. Skea um, an email where she can I'll, I'll tell you, like, this weekend is a reconvening of the um, Republican convention that I am involved in in, in some terrible ways. Um, and after that, I will have a lot more time to put sure. towards this. If you, can, if you can just provide your sources and yeah. information. Thank, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and there were a couple of uh, sources here that were identified. I wanted. Is there anyone else that is in the audience that are giving here to your testimony on fluoride or against. Sir, if you could identify yourself. And I'm uh, Dr. Jess Ellis. I'm sorry? Jess Ellis. Okay. And is it J-E-S-S? -S? Yes. Ellis? E-L-L-I-S? Yes. And you say you're a doctor, sir? I'm an endodontist. Endodontist. Okay. If you would uh, give a testimony to that microphone, for just in case. Can you, can you, can everybody hear Dr. Ellis? Sorry about that. We don't have a stick mic, so just get in the right Okay. Um, uh, I'm just sort of a practical type of guy. Uh, you might notice I'm wearing car hearts uh, as opposed to a suit and tie and whatnot. Uh, I grew up on a, a farm. Uh, dentistry was the last thing I expected to find myself in. Uh, but uh, much to my surprise, uh, uh, I did. Um, I didn't expect to find myself in Alaska, but I'm here. 
Um, I've been uh, an itinerant endodontist uh, uh, the last uh, 23 years in Alaska. I've uh, practiced uh, in Fairbanks and Anchorage and, and Juneau and Soldotna and Homer and Wrangell. And, and so I've, I've been around, I've seen uh, a lot of teeth. Uh, it's uh, probably uh, tooth decay that uh, is my uh, uh, main source of uh, positive revenue and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I see that in certain generations and different populations, there's a lot more tooth decay than others and stuff like that. Um, and and so I look at uh, at fluoride as uh, having been a, a great benefit to a lot of people as far as the uh, reduction of tooth decay. Now I understand there's people who who uh, would uh, dispute that, and they're entitled to their opinion. My opinion is that it has uh, been a benefit. Um, uh, I, I see people from certain regions of the country uh, who have uh, cavities, the fillings, you know, from from uh, one side or not the other, and uh, and I see other populations who uh, don't have a single cavity. Uh, my mother. Um, never had a, a cavity, uh, and her sister never had a cavity, uh, and they grew up in, in uh, West Texas, where there's a lot of natural fluoride in the water. So this kind of brings up uh, a question that I have for myself when I listen to some of the, the comments about the poison in the water, is uh, I would suggest that this committee look into the question is, is there a better kind of fluoride? You know, if you don't like industrial waste, as it's referred to, you know, is there, you know, a better fluoride? Is there, you know, uh, some way to fluoridate water that has um, a less toxic, if you want to use that expression, uh, fluoride? And uh, and I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's one that's worthy of investigation. Uh, my one aunt that I mentioned who never had a cavity uh, also had dentures. Uh, she lost all of her teeth. None of them had a cavity in it. She lost it from periodontal disease. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's a complex uh, issue and stuff like that. Um, there's some people who would suggest that, that uh, you know, you should take all the toxins out of the water system, why not? If you took all the toxins out of the water system, you would have no water system because water itself is toxic. Uh, in the wrong concentrations. Uh, I can probably explain that in when I tell you that my brother, uh, who's a physician, treated a, a case in Hawaii when he was there doing his residency, and uh, a child uh, was deathly ill, and it turned out that the caregivers were uh, just massively giving water to this child where it threw her electrolytes uh, out of balance, and, and uh, they about lost the child before they figured out what the problem was. So the water itself can be toxic. Everything uh, that's good can also be bad in the wrong quantities and stuff like that. So another question I would suggest that you look into is, you know, if, if there is to be fluoridation, is there a better level? Uh, that would cause some of the potential problems if you have too much fluoride. And you, you say you don't have an answer to that either, don't I, I don't have the answer to that, but I, th I think it's a relevant question. So, is there a better uh, type of fluoride and is there a better concentration? Mr. Chair, question. Ms. Drummond. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ellis, for coming. Um, you said there was a lot of natural fluoride in the water in West Texas. Yes. What is the chemical uh, composition of that natural fluoride? Yeah, it was mentioned, somebody mentioned it previously. Yeah. Uh, I think you said calcium fluoride. Though. Calcium fluoride occurs naturally. Sodium fluoride is what they're using the industrial waste. It's actually a byproduct from industrial processes. And like you said before, there's a difference. Well, there's a difference between something that's pharmaceutical grade, like you're talking about, which I still oppose, I'll say, versus something that is a result of industrial processing. We also want to uh, calcium fluoride. <laughs> and uh, the 
fluorosilicic silicate is <coughs> Na2F6 SI. Is that the sodium fluoride? Anything else you need to add, Doc? Um, well, I, I would just suggest that uh, uh, if, if there's a reason for putting you know, fluoride in the water, which I assume uh, for most of the discussion it is uh, it's <coughs> to uh, prevent dentary and stuff like that, uh, I think that that's valid from my experience. Um, if you uh, choose to take the fluoride of the water, um, you know, that only helps me economically because I'm going to be doing more root canals and stuff like that uh, in my experience. Um, so I, I think it's a tool. Uh, if you uh, uh, if people don't want it in the water, uh, you have a lot of people on well water that in, in these communities or not, uh, but they don't have it. Uh, really, we're talking about a pretty uh, I don't know what you call it small, but it's just a certain segment of the population that's on city water system that has a minute and whatnot. And, and there's a, the, the potential to, to have filters, there's potential to have bottled water and stuff like that. So there's, for those who have uh, you know, health problems and stuff like that, you know, there are alternatives. If you decide to take it out of the water, then you have the question of you know, what does that do? Uh, you know, there's long term effects of that as far as dental caries and, and the effect on health for that. And some of those are very long term you know, processes. Anyway, those are the main points I have. Thanks, sir. Very brief question for the doctor, if I may. Um, real brief question. Yeah, my name is Joseph Princiota, P R I N C I O T T A. For the record, I am representing no one but myself. Doctor, are you qualified to write prescriptions? Yes. Uh, you have a prescription pad? No, I mean, you, in, your, in your office, and you sign prescriptions for people? If it's dental related. Do you issue a prescription for a patient you have never examined? Try not to. You have done it in the past? Yeah, you've actually tried issued? not to. Is your answer that you've actually issued a prescription, prescription for a patient? I, I gave you a little examined? latitude. You asked a question. You had to continue to pepper the question. Mr. Prince, I, I think we get your point. Um, Do we have an answer from the doctor? He said he tries not to give uh, prescriptions. I'm going to cut that part off here. Do you have anything else, Mr. Pritzio? I of me and other committees. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. I do write prescriptions. I have written a prescription in the past for a patient I've never seen, but uh, took their word as to they had no allergies uh, and they defined what their problem was. It seemed uh, routine enough that I would chance to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, Mr. Pritzio, you were in line to give either a question or a comment for it. I signed up for that. Yes. I have a gentleman from Girdwood on the phone. I'd like to testify. Can you yield him real quick? And then okay. Make it easy. okay. Mr. Cutler, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Sure can. Can you go ahead and uh, just spell your name because we're putting it on record and this will be tape recorded. Um, okay, my name is Evan Cutler, E B A N D U T L E R. Okay. And I live in Girdwood. Okay, if you can give us your information, please. Uh, we're trying to be succinct, but I understand you've been waiting patient. Okay, I was told I had about two minutes, so yeah. I'll give it two minutes. Um, uh, I'm Evan Cutler. I graduated from Colorado State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Health, and I was also in charge of the MSDS compliance for the University of Colorado State University in Environmental Health Services during that time. And if you look at the material safety data sheet for sodium fluoride, you'll find that it is listed as mutagenic for mammalian somatic cells, mutagenic for bacteria and their use of substance may be toxic to kidneys, lungs, the nervous system, heart, gastrointestinal tract, cardiovascular system, bone, and teeth. Repeated or prolonged exposure can produce target organ damage. Um, I am aware that uh, in environmental health, we, we, we were taught that uh, you know, in sanitation classes, that they were at it starting around the 1930s, I guess, as long as the most part as um, uh, uh, dentrophic preventatives. And we have the studies, a lot of longitudinal studies that have occurred in the past 30, 40 years of finding that um, there is essentially no difference in the dental caries rate between those who have sodium fluoride added to their water and those who don't. There's only a lot of longitudinal studies between the European and the United States. Most of our water is fluoridated and most of ours does not. Um, 
myself, I'm especially interested in maintaining my intelligence. And uh, sodium fluoride is known to not diminish intelligence. There are a number of studies demonstrating that. I do not want to be consuming it, and I would like it not to be added to the water that I drink. I, I cannot buy a filter that will filter it out. I have to buy a, a multi-hundred dollar reverse osmosis system with very expensive changeovers to be able to get the fluoride out of the water. It simply doesn't have to be there. The arguments for having the fluoride in the water are outdated. And research and knowledge shows that it's toxic, and we don't need it added to the water. I understand that the past education of our water treatment uh, officials have told us that it's the right thing to add, but that is now mistaken and proven mistaken knowledge. And I would like to thank Rich Municipality with follow the example of Paradise and Juno and Europe and an increasing number of communities to stop adding poison to our water so that I don't have not to drink it and consume it. Okay. I brush my teeth already. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, That's my testimony. If you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, Mr. Trent, Mr. Trent. No, I don't have any questions. Well, Evan, uh, I, I really appreciate it, Mr. Bell. I, I appreciate you calling and, and having your interest in this. And um, this is a fact finding and information gathering uh, the committee meeting. I'm sorry. Really you. You're breaking up this a little bit. Sorry. This is a fact finding and educational information uh, committee meeting for the Public Safety Committee of the Assembly. And uh, we recognize the community concerns as well as an attempt to um, either change directions, uh, reduce, or eliminate altogether for I or continue as is. So there's many options on the table. I appreciate your suggestion. Just talking about those intelligence studies, the studies indicate that there seems to be about a 10 percent of the point IQ drop for those people that are consuming um, fluoride and they're drinking water compared to those who do not. And it's so like to have um, almost a standard deviation of intelligence higher than we would do ourselves well to eliminate the sodium fluoride from our drinking water. Yeah, I think Ms. Drummond has uh, a question, but before I let you go, um, uh, would you please be able to uh, refer any source documents that you've gleaned information from? I know you've stated a lot of information, statistics. If you could uh, get it to my email to the municipality on the website that are uh, assembly section. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that next week. Um, I'd be busy for this week. Very good. Ms. Drummond has a question for you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cutler. Have, are you aware of any communities that put calcium fluoride in their water as opposed to sodium fluoride. That I'm not an expert. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So we have uh, several pieces of information from community concerns, and I want to balance this out. With information education is why we're here, and I have some follow-up questions here. The health community and, and uh, the health department as well as they would. I appreciate that, Ms. Single, and I know that you weren't here since the beginning of 19, whenever we, 21, I believe it was, or when we incorporated as a municipality or a city in the municipality in the 70s. Um, but at some point, the municipality has to endorse fluoride in the water. So uh, it's in the water, and it's a public, it's, uh, I guess the justification of the need for it in the water at this point, it, was it based on public health? Do you, do you recall or do you know? I can't speak for how the water, what made fluoride be
legislative prerogative, certainly, to look into this and hear different sides and make different proposals, and we, we will answer your questions and respond as best we can. We may not have the answers today. And I will give lead back to Ms. Drummond about specific data and information she may be looking for. It's not a bad idea. However, at the same time, recognizing the difficulty going back to the early days, uh, if we could find where those documents are, anything is stated in the justification. Oftentimes, like it's like the Constitution of the United States, the people who were there, our founding fathers, it's difficult to know what their intent was based on what you read on the piece of paper. But, but I would just give reiterate that we're here to, to be a resource and to get information, but yes. we did not. This is something that you you brought forward and we're here to That's support, support your interest in looking into the issue, but we don't. The department doesn't. The administration doesn't have a different position other than what our current department is proposed, and we can't really respond to anything that we don't have a. Okay. So on the list of things that we need facts for, it may not be with the job of either of these two departments, but we need a history of the municipal code how far I got into the municipal code, what year that was done. We have paper going back to God knows when. Um, the clerk's office is certainly capable of doing that, getting that research for us. Um, but we need to know the, the historical the historical piece of how fluoride came to be placed in our water. And Thank then you. I also understood that you were interested in trying to get a more accurate number of how many people are exposed. That's correct. And, right. um, And keeping notes of things that you are interested in, and we are certainly happy and willing to assist with you getting them. Very good, thank you. And just so you know, for the assembly members, colleagues, uh, Ms. Kate is actually, as long as the computer technology stays with us, she's taking notes and we'll have some good information. So I'm really interested in learning from the Centers for Disease Control Prevention and the Alaska Dental Society. Dr. Thomas, are you willing to give us a comment? I'm here. I, I no longer work for the Centers for Disease Control. Oh, okay. Uh, I work for Alaska Native Tribal Association. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, if I, I'll get back to you just a minute then. Uh, Dr. Toll, Mr. Toll, is it possible to uh, get the position of the Alaska Dental Society about for it? It certainly is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members, I am Jim Toll, the executive director of the Alaska Dental Society. I am not a dentist. Um, I'm an administrator of a professional organization, the Alaska Dental Society is a constituent of the American Dental Association, and we have seven component societies, of which the Anchorage Dental Society um, is one. The position of, uh, I'll refer to it as organized dentistry, those dentists who choose to join the professional society, um, is one of prevention, and they view uh, based on the historical evidence and research and scientific evidence that's available to them, that community water coordination is an excellent tool for the prevention of all diseases, primarily carriers. Um, the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention has, in fact, proclaimed that uh, community water coordination is one of the 10 greatest public health achievements in the 20th century. They have they said that. They're on record and they have not backed down, nor have they retreated from that. Um, as a public health measure, fluoridation, from our perspective, best compared to fortifying salt with iodine, fortifying milk with vitamin D, fortifying orange juice with calcium. Um, one of the primary advantages of, of uh, community water fluoridation is it benefits everyone without demanding of them personal behavior changes. Uh, you get the advantages without brushing twice a day. You don't have to remember to brush before you leave the house in the morning. You don't have to remember to brush before you go to bed at night uh, because you're going to be consuming water and it benefits uh, the residents in that way. Um, it is a benefit that is primarily in discussion talked about children, but the benefits in preventing cavities are throughout life. It's that our population is aging, people are retaining their teeth longer, and our senior citizens as well as our 
middle-aged and children all benefit from having that preventive element in their diet. I will let the dentist here address the question and it's been stated whether topical uh, application is preferable to ingestion, but I have been repeatedly told by my members that they can tell the difference and they know that through ingestion that is, builds the strongest and healthiest teeth. That, applicant, that uh, topical application is an excellent alternative when that is not available and something that uh, we promote. Um, there have been years of research. You were becoming aware that uh, you can be like a panel of economic economists. There are a wide variety of experts representing a full um, spectrum, but uh, I would uh, argue that the bulk of the expertise and the bulk of the science begin to assemble it for you carefully. Is supportive of community water fluoridation as an effective tool for the prevention of caries. Um, there are certain uh, recognized uh, risks. One of those is fluorosis, which is a dis uh, discoloration. Fluorosis is not a disease. I don't think the dentist here, the physicians will tell you that it is a disease. It is a matter of discoloration uh, that goes on. Um, what has not been addressed are the complications, and, and uh, we have been told that Juno, you know, uh, which was the first major city recently to do it, uh, the members of the Alaska Dental Society of Practice of Juno you know, are telling us that they are already beginning to see the ramifications of that, that they're, uh, they are noticing uh, people with weaker tooth structure. Now, we don't have science yet to back that because it's also takes time. But the advantage of the prevention is that it is aimed and the real people who benefit from it are those who are most disadvantaged to access care. And one of the challenges that you have or as a lot of public officials you know about is when you and should you make the decision to remove that, I think every dentist can medical provider will tell you that eventually within the city of Anchorage, you will see an increase in caries. And that increase will be highest in the low income and those least able to afford alternatives. And uh, it will have a, an economic impact. It will drive up your Medicaid expenses. I'm gonna, excuse me just a minute. Sure. I'm going to ask, I hear a little mumbling in the back, please, uh, if you need to have a conversation with somebody, take it out of the room. Uh, we're here uh, all about respect. We give you the opportunity to speak. If there's a recognized question, we'll go to the chair. Uh, Mr. Tolbert, you're about to conclude. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can, I've got a number of other points, which I, uh, to some extent, are repetitive. But again, with prevention and, and with uh, any of those people at least. The problem is, and, and Dr. Kovaleski can tell you, that when you get massive decay, which is uh, all too common and unfortunate in low-income children, you have to treat it in an OR with a number of people there. And uh, again, I, the, the reality is that you and I as taxpayers are the ones who have to pick up the tab of that. And uh, the cost effectiveness of the prevention of decay and the, and the benefit to those elements of society or at least able to afford it uh, are the primary ones, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me. And if there's documents, uh, Mr. Uh, Tony, you, you probably heard me uh, already ask other speakers if you could provide those. More than happy to uh, provide over the library. Um, and just let me say that it's been addressed at the ADA, uh, and then I will say that the ADA, of which I represent, um, it wasn't in abundance of caution that it issued uh, an interim document, guidance document, uh, regarding the infant formula. Um, they have revised that. I will get the revised version um, to your assistant. Um, and 
it is a concern, but uh, there are ways to deal with that in the ADA and its constituent societies, including the Alaska Dental Society, stand firmly in favor of continued our water fluoridation. There was a National Preventive Dem Dentistry demonstration uh, that was published in the cost and effectiveness of various types and combinations of uh, school-based preventive dental care procedures. Uh, a program involved nearly 10,000 grade school children from fluoridated and non-fluoridated communities studied over four years. The results showed that those school-based dental uh, health lessons, uh, weekly and bi-weekly brushing and flossing were not consistently effective in preventing clinical significant amounts of tooth decay beyond the already preventive uh, types of home and dental care office. The same study concluded that fluoridation was the most cost-effective means Elected public officials are the one who is most cost effective way that we have. Mr. Chairman, yes. Mr. Tull. Thank you, Mr. Tull. Um, you said that the ADA provides a document regarding uh, infant formula. Can you, can you describe, um, without providing the document, can you briefly describe how they propose to handle fluoridation in, 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 in infant formula? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that off the top of my head. I can get that to you. Yeah, I would, I would appreciate that. Because that, that has been suggested as a, um, as a beginning point to me as an elected official is to, to insert a warning, um, uh, a warning in the AWW water bills to parents of infants who mix formula with fluoridated water, with their domestic water. Um, and I think it would be crucial to this organization to know how the ADA proposes to um, to handle that that concern, which is a big concern because infants are uh, have no control over what goes in their body. They can't go out and shop for non-fluoridated water. They are totally dependent on their on their parents to um, control the amount of fluoride that enters their very small systems, which is quite a different size person than an adult. So I, I would appreciate that. You don't, you don't have any sort of summary in mind. I mean, it, se it seems to me that you should. Or anyone else, any room aware of, of what so the ADA yeah, proposes to them? Yeah. Um, I'm Dr. Mary Willard um, from the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, and uh, I'm a dentist. And I brought along a, pa a paper that has a quote, um, not from the ADA, but from Dr. Howard Coe, who was the um, health and human services assistant secretary for health in 2011. And he summarized the infant formula question this way. Parents and caregivers can use fluoridated water for preparing infant formula. He said they can use it. However, if the child, if the child is excessively consuming infant formula reconstituted with fluoridated water, there is an increased potential for mild dental fluorosis. The majority of fluoride comes from the water used to mix the formula in that instance. Some parents may choose to use low fluoride bottled water some of the time to mix infant fluoride, infant formula. So he doesn't even say they have to use non-fluoridated water, but low fluoride would be acceptable. Uh, and just so you know, we've heard about 40 minutes or more better of uh, information from members who are concerned about fluoride and water. So in the interest of time and the meeting, I'd like to hear from some of the more the subject matter experts. Can I ask a question? Uh, no, not at this point, sir. I, I'm going to move on. If we have time for the, but towards the end of it, I'll, I'll have a, a follow up questions along. Sir, are you with the industry? I, that's right, you're with the... Uh, I'll, I'll ask any tribal health. Yes, please. I, I could add some comments if you like. Name again, again, your name again, sir? My name is Troy Ritter. I work as Applied Science and Manager for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. I've been working with water systems and water and health issues in Alaska since uh, 1999. I think one thing I'd like to add, kind of building on uh, Dr. Willard's comments, is you know the, 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 the basic principle of the field of toxicology is that all things are either safe or poison, depending on how much you have. So the idea that fluoride is a poison. That could be true. So are carrot sticks or plain water or anything else you can put in your body. 
So the issue itself isn't so much poison or non-poison, but how much fluoride are you putting in your body? Sure, uh, a child is smaller than a person, an adult person, but they probably drink less water. So if you're going to drink a lot of that, then that could be a problem with anything. You know, I, I, uh, I know in my work I had someone that called me uh, a while ago and said, hey, uh, my son drank like uh, 12 of those Red Bulls, you know, can he die or not? And we had to look it up, and there's a formula. You know, you can die from Red Bull, but you gotta drink a bunch of it. Fluoride, like anything else, is either safe or poison, no matter how much you have. Now, I wanted to just talk for a minute, and maybe to follow up on a few things I've heard here today. Uh, the topic of medicine has come up. Medicine is something that affects health. Kind of the same, uh, top, kind of the same thing. Pretty much everything affects health. One of the things I wanted to follow up on also was with the caller. Uh, I also have that same degree they talked about, the uh, degree in environmental health science. I went on to get a master's degree in public health and I'm a fifth year PhD student studying water and health in Alaska. You know, I don't know of any mainstream public health or health organization that opposes water fluoridation. Some individuals within those organizations do. Uh, so yeah, we have that degree. What's important to note is that the National Environmental Health Association, the association that, that sort of governs our profession, strongly supports water fluoridation. I'm also a past president of the Alaska Environmental Health Association. Uh, we support water fluoridation. I'm not here to speak for uh, the Alaska Environmental Health Association, but I can tell you that's the, the case. I think I came here to talk about fluoride. Maybe what I could provide that's a little more beneficial is it's just some thoughts on maybe the human brain and how we think about fear and topics and, and give some information about yeah, this. Yeah, we'll do that pretty succinctly, you know. I can do it very, very fast. You know, I heard things here today, you know, talk, people talk about their health conditions and, and certain problems and a statement such as, you know, I, I can't prove this, but I suspect fluoride is the cause of this. And, and, and I don't know how harmful fluoride was to my condition. When people have a problem, it's natural to look for the cause. When we have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Our brains are programmed, wired to think fear first, and logic and reason second. So when you hear these columnists, things like neurotoxin, hypertension, or apoptosis, uh, there's a long list. It's natural for us to be concerned about these. I think what I would caution uh, the assembly and, and all, everyone involved in is to think through these issues, to rely on the experts that we have put into positions of, of, of authority on, on public health topics in Anchorage, and really let uh, the logic and reason come forward and let the fear dissipate under it. This is such a, this is a, a topic of such high emotion, and I've seen this over and over. I've, I've been to so many different community meetings like this and seen the same thing. It, it, it's, it's very difficult when you're trying to deal with this on a community-wide issue because fear spreads very quickly, logic and reason spreads very slowly. So this is a difficult issue to handle in a public election because uh, just the enormity and the complexity and just the way our, our brains are wired. But I, I'd love to talk on this all day. It's really fun. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I'll just leave it at that. Mr. Carman, you have a question. Thank Please. you. I appreciate that you're here, Mr. Ritter, and also the others from the Alaska Tribal Health Consortium. Um, I'm just curious who your patients are at the Alaska Tribal Health Consortium. Because this is, this, we're talking about Anchorage's water, and I know a lot of you folks have a statewide perspective. I'm, I'm really interested in the kind of data that you've collected on the communities that you work with around the state, as well as Anchorage, and, and um, your data on communities that are fluoridated and communities that are not fluoridated, and how it relates to your, to your uh, patients. Sure. Well, let, let me explain. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium serves American Indian and Alaska Native people who live in Alaska. About half of those people are living in Anchorage. So, so we certainly have um, an interest in this topic in Anchorage, uh, even though we might be perceived as being uh, uh, an organization that serves rural villages. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Thomas, for example, has published uh, so, so some work, uh, working on some studies. There's been a lot of studies that have been done uh, throughout the U.S. And, and a couple here in Alaska where we've looked at the topic of, of water fluoridation and, and health or, or dental care. Uh, I would be surprised if, if the assembly doesn't already have those, but those can be provided easily. Uh, I'm 
further on that on that thought. Um, it's my understanding that it's about 100 to 120,000 Alaska Natives in the state of Alaska, and right. just 20,000 live in Anchorage. Um, I'm, again, it's a, it's a point of data I, I would really like to have. You know, before we throw out statistics, there's a lot of talk about chemistry and science and statistics and environmental, uh, you know, percentages and parts per billion and parts per million. I yeah. really would appreciate that we have accurate numbers. Yeah. Um, because Anchorage is known to be the largest village in Alaska of, of Alaska Native. My husband is part American Indian. Um, I've got a fair amount of knowledge of, of what has happened in, in rural communities, but we're here to talk about Anchorage. Yeah. So I would appreciate your, if you could pull your experience in rural communities and, and uh, related to what you're finding in Anchorage, and I'm really interested in rural communities that aren't fluoridated and what the dental community that serves those communities finds. Um, um, uh, as a school, as a former school board member, I, I can't tell you when this happened. It's got to be at least around 2000. The dental community, uh, I, I don't recall if it was state or local, held a very large forum at the BP Energy Center. We were shown about two hours worth of slides of, of infants whose teeth erupted from their gums, rot, because their parents put them to sleep with not water in their bottles but soda. We saw photographs of super cups filled with soda, sugared soda, being transported to Bush, Alaska, not water. Um, there are some serious health issues that all of you know uh, result from, from uh, the inability of rural communities to get clean water um, and the inability to control the amount of sugared sodas that they drink. And Things have changed in 10 or 12 years, I'm sure. Um, but fluoride is not the only reason that these communities have serious uh, dental care issues. And we all know that. And our school, dis our school district has done its best to get sugared sodas out of the, out of the schools, out of, out, of, uh, uh, out of vending machines, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of other issues besides fluoride that affect caries. And I'd like everybody to, to, to stay on top of that. Well, um, and I, and I thank you. I'd like to follow up with Native uh, um, Health Consortium, Native Alaska Native Health Consortium. Been some commentary, and I know. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, with your uh, uh, subject matter area. And I, maybe it is you, Dr. Thomas, since you uh, identified you're now with. Is there someone from the Alaska Native Health uh, Travel Consortium that has a position, official position, on fluoride in the drinking water in Anchorage? There's something someone would like to be able to state on behalf of. Someone authorized. It? Well, let, let me say, I'm not, I'm not here to get uh, the organization's position, but I can tell you that uh, I've worked at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium since 2003, and, and we have programs that specifically uh, work to promote uh, water fluoridation in, in villages uh, and, and keep people uh, to ensure that it's used properly. So, so we've been supporting water fluoridation for, for a, a long time, and we'll continue. Is that position that continue fluoridation? They, I mean, I'm asking for suggestions, some some solutions or suggestions. Reduce, eliminate, continue in its form. Um, I'm, I'm the uh, Alaska Area Dental Officer for, and also the dental consultant for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, uh, and um, we support the fluoridation of water, community water supplies. Um, At the existing level. Yeah, yes, and we'll, we'll listen to the CDC's recommendations as well for decreasing the levels um, when those are finalized. I would like to correct the statements that have been made so far that the CDC's recommendations are not finalized at this point. Um, they are still researching the information about lowering the, the um, rate to 0 0.7. And um, uh, that, uh, as a uh, as we heard already, the, the reason for lowering that is because we are using good science. We are very conscientious uh, healthcare providers in public health and at the CDC. And, um, you know, when you have something that works well, you want to use it at the correct amount. And if 0 0.7 works just as well as 1.2, then there is no need to afford it any higher than that. So let's not do it. And that's a very appropriate. Um, position to take. And it's not because they, they believe that it's harmful 
um, to have that fluoride in the water. They just believe that the most benefit with the least amount of uh, side effects of undesirable effects would be the 0.7. Um, and those side effects that they cite are mild dental fluorosis. I've worked on the Navajo Reservation where they have communities that are in fluoridated, that drink fluoridated water that is naturally fluoridated above the levels that are recommended. And we did have quite a bit of fluoridation of fluorosis in the teeth in those communities. And um, me working out in those communities with my real bright lights and all of my instruments so that I can check the teeth as closely as possible, it was very difficult to to be able to determine whether the tooth actually had mild fluorosis or not. It's not until you get into the high or severe fluorosis range when the normal eye can actually see what's happening. There is no problem with mild fluorosis as far as being uh, a detriment to being able to function well with your teeth. You can chew, the teeth do not fall apart, they're actually stronger and resist decay better. Yes. Um, is it my understanding that the AWW has already reduced the amount of fluoride? Yes. And was it based on the same kind of good science that Dr. Ritter is talking about? It was Excuse me, Dr. Willard. It was based on the recommendations that we received from the, I believe it's the U.S. Department of and, and what, and that it's, it's just not final. She's saying that's a okay. preliminary finding okay. and it's not finalized. Is that correct? Yes. But, so your, your recommendations to your member communities, the communities that you serve, is not final yet, so that none of them have reduced the amount of fluoride that they put in their water. If I can uh, give some, some history to this. Uh, in uh, 2002, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium sent uh, letters to communities, uh, I believe all the fluoridating water systems in Alaska, saying that, that, this, uh, that this change is coming down the road and that if they wanted, they could be proactive and go ahead and implement the new level. And, and as a rule, uh, the, the village communities in Alaska have been uh, operating at the, the new lower rate, uh, or the new lower level since, since that time in, in general. I can provide a copy of that letter. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. yeah, that was fun. Um, Thank you. So the change in Alaska really isn't as much of a change. We've been doing it for over a decade. I'd like to hear briefly. Ms. Culpepper, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I kind of want to go because I, my name is Bruce Culpepper. I'm the chair of the Alaska Dental Action Coalition, and um, I'm a day job with the Alaska Dental Health Trust Authority. We um, support dental issues because we, our beneficiaries are usually low income and have surprisingly a number of dental um, problems. But I've been letting all, our coalition has 40 organizations, most of in the room, and so we have a flooring committee that, that Troy has um, been chair of and working on fluoridation of water um, systems as well as topical fluoride application in other ways uh, across the state and looking at um, education and other things. And we just wanted to make sure that everyone heard both sides, and I'm really pleased to hear that you're fact and looking. I mean, if, you know, from any public health person, um, will I'll tell you that um, we want to not have um, adverse health effects. But when people say adverse health effects, we have to be very specific and we have to look at except, you know, what the general scientific community says um, um, that to make sure that the um, studies are reputable and have, are from um, good sources and then look at things. There, as far as there's ups and downs. So, we're glad that you're doing your fact-finding. Any of our um, professionals, other people are happy to help you find the studies or other um, information. We have a letter um, from the Dell Action Coalition um, just supporting a good process um, because we, we fear that maybe in some of the other communities that the process is a little too fast and a little too emotional without looking at you know, where those um, studies are coming from and, and balancing that with, with so your recommendation as, a, as an association? Um, as, as, the a process? Coalition, as a coalition, yeah. um, I would say um, all of us have resolutions within our individual organizations um, supporting fluoridation okay. at, at levels recommended by CDC. And, um, and I, I will say I'm also a um, two-time past president of the Alaska Public Health Association, and, and we have um, resolutions in favor of fluoridation. Mr. Luby from AARP, is there 
position? Yeah, but I was looking at Dr. Colbert's our chief medical officer yes. for the state. I'm going to get to him. Okay. I, I didn't know if you had a succinct statement or, or I can, Yes, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Okay. My name is Pat Luby, L-U-B-Y. I'm the acting director for ARP and last uh, chairman of the committee. Um, in World War I and World War II, most of the people who were declining from the draft for oral health purposes because they could not find six opposing teeth upper and lower. And we've come a long way since then. Uh, grandparents today can look at their grandchildren and know that primarily because of the dental care, but also because of the fluoridation, uh, that their, the teeth of their grandchildren are much healthier, particularly in some of those communities that we already have fluoridation. Only about half the United States is fluoridated. ARP's position is that we ought to be 100% fluoridated in our water public water system. And, and we would encourage Anchorage to continue with what they're doing. There are really no medical organizations, no dental organizations, no health organizations that have come out against fluoridation. You know, people are good science being done by the CDC in particular, but with those recommendations on what level it ought to be. And uh, there's been a lot of experiments with. Uh, Fluoride's kind of to do that as sealants with children that has been somewhat successful. All of us drink water. Not all of us are going to have kids that have sealants. And one of the things that we want to make sure is that all our kids, all our adults have access to fluoride in the public water systems. Thank you very much. Dr. Herbert, if it's possible, uh, sir, to, I know you're the uh, Chief Medical Officer Director of the Alaska Division of Public Health, correct? And is there a, anything that you'd like to be able to share with us on behalf of the, I mean, I know this is a statewide issue that you're overseeing. Um, is there something that we should know about from the state's level recommendation or knowledge of some of the information that's been received today? Yes. Um, okay, Mr. Chair, uh, for the record, my name is Ward Herbert. I am the Director of the Public Health Chief Medical Officer of the State of Alaska. Um, I first came to Alaska in 1961. Uh, spent the first couple of years in Dillingham. And Alaska has been our home most of the time since then. We've spent some time outside, uh, but the rest of time Anchorage has always been our home. Uh, in the 60s, I don't have the documentation that I'm sure uh, the department has here, but clearly the discussion added uh, the fluoride in the water was related to dental caries. Um, and that was the reason it was done. The, the use of fluoride was kind of a natural experiment where it was noted that in places where there was high fluoride in the water, there were problems with the fluorosis with, with the whitening and the blackening of the teeth, but it was discovered that it, that it did reduce dental cavities. Uh, and so then uh, it was found that at a low level, at the level of the 0.7 to 1.2 or 0.3 uh, parts per million, you had some whitening in about 30% of the kids, uh, but otherwise a, a reduction. And initially, nationally, the reduction was about 50 to 60% in dental cavities. With the addition of fluoride to toothpaste, with the use by a dentist of uh, uh, fluoride uh, treatments, uh, that reduction now is, is more in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 percent because there is fluoride uh, coming uh, in, in other ways. But it was a natural experiment there, uh, and, and that has been demonstrated through observational studies nationally. As has been mentioned, CDC, uh, at the end of the last century, uh, for Y2K, said, what are the, the uh, the major public health achievements of the last century, and they need 10 items like vaccination, where in my early days of my training, we saw kids uh, in iron lungs for polio, and uh, we saw came along, and we were able to prevent that. The motor vehicle safety, uh, where we had seat belts come in, and the, the mandatory use of seat belts and so on. Uh, the, one of the 10 was the fluoridation of water that was recognized as a seminal public health achievement of the last century that we have. There are more recent studies, for example, the state of New York looked at Medicaid recipients, where they have several million recipients in the state of New York, um, and they found that in counties, um, and, and as uh, Assembly Person Governors pointed out, uh, there are people in Athens that don't have water. Uh, we live on the hill side and, and we have our own well, but at the Frontier Building, I drink fluoridated water uh, every day. So what they had to do in New York, they took the counties where the, predominantly the people were exposed to fluoridated water systems and others where they were not and found a 33% reduction 
in the use of down procedures and loss of teeth uh, in kids where they were exposed to the fluoride. Uh, come closer to home, just last year, CDC, uh, working with the Arctic Investigations Lab here, published a study comparing Alaska Native villages where the water system is fluoridated and some where they still are not. There's still some where they're not fluoridated. Uh, and they found a 25% uh, reduction in, in, in fluoride uh, there, uh, here in Alaska, looking at that. Um, so, and there are older, uh, older studies uh, that, that have looked, uh, looked at that. Uh, we do do other interventions. It was mentioned that we had, we require iodine and salt. That's to prevent goiter. We require enriched rice or enriched, enriched wheat and bread. Uh, that's to prevent the niacin deficiencies that we get from black or the other diseases that you get from that. Uh, we do have the chlorine in the water. Uh, public health started with the Broad Street Pump, John, Dr. Jonathan Snow, who found the, the cholera epidemic uh, and took the handle off, dismantled the pump. But that led to adding a substance to the, the water uh, to keep people from getting cholera and typhoid and other diseases that you could get from that. Uh, we do have a dental section uh, within the Division of Public Health, and, and we do try to work very assiduously to share the information. We believe that the fluoridation of water uh, is important to our citizens, that it is uh, an important public health benefit. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions for I do? Right. Real quick question I might have, and I don't know. Perhaps you may know. Um, I understand that perhaps uh, Mr. Cheney shared with me that Palmer, City of Palmer, who stopped fluoridation of the, yeah, I may be getting this wrong, is it the sodium fluoride, the stoad kind, the calcium fluoride? Is it good? Okay. That, that is determined that, that, that Matsu, or at least in Palmer, their water source has a naturally occurring calcium fluoride. Is that true? Uh, it would depend on the location. But areas where you have sufficient naturally occurring fluoride uh, provide that protection. Uh, I am not aware of uh, evidence that, that I'm aware of that I find credible that sodium fluoride is a poison or is bad for you or that the calcium fluoride is worse. I, I think the question that's been raised today is reasonable uh, and, and that's the information that you would want to know. Yes. But uh, it is important to know how much fluoride is in the water. If you add more, it does cause fluorosis. So if you have a naturally occurring level of one or two parts per million, and then you add another one part per million, you're going to have more fluorosis. It doesn't shorten your life. Uh, it, it doesn't do anything. It may make your teeth look white. It was described where it can be hard to see or if it gets high enough that it can actually get black. You don't have cavities as much, um, but, but it isn't cosmetic. Does the See. I'm sorry, you're the director of the, oh, the State Division of Public Health. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Um, do you take a position on communities removing fluoride from their water, such as Palmer, such as Fairbanks, um, or does the state not govern those types of decisions? The state does not take a formal position in that the state does not believe its role is to intrude into local affairs. Uh, that's a part of our overall philosophy here in Alaska. So neither the state legislature nor the governor has taken a formal uh, position. We do have our dental public health section, and we have worked with Fairbanks, we have worked with Palmer, we worked with Juno. Basically, from our standpoint, we failed uh, when the decision was made to remove fluoride. So, as a public health division, that we, we do believe that fluoride is important, but the state does not, in the sense that you asked the question, have a formal position as a part of our philosophy that that which should govern itself, and honor should govern itself, and there are other issues. Mr. Trinian. Mr. Trinian. There's a question the areas of the state that have got rid of fluoride. Is it based on economics because they don't have to spend the money on it, or is it based on sound science in your point of view? From my understanding, where the fluoride has been removed has consistently been because of concern that it may present a danger to the citizens, that it has not been driven by the economic situation. And you, Mr. Prince, I just a brief question for you. Do you know whether or not the 
substance that's being put into our water has been specifically produced for the application of putting it in our water, or if the substance that's being put in our water happens to be a byproduct of some other uh, chemical process and thereby ha has actually no value anywhere else except to stick it in our water at our expense. Is it produced for us to be put in our water? Is it produced to medical standards? When I have been responsible for programs where it was purchased, the sodium fluoride that was purchased was produced for that purpose. It was marketed for that purpose. It was a business. To specifically answer your question, I, I don't have that. Experience. It was not a byproduct of another process. It was originally, specifically, Mr. Prince, you know, that's my understanding. I, I want to make sure we, we, we've got a limited time for the room and availability for the meeting that's made all public. So I want to continue to speak as long. I appreciate the dialogue. Okay, I, I understand. What we're going to do is, is my understanding, just so you know, and maybe perhaps they were focusing, different vendors for the chloride that you, or fluoride that you purchased to put into the product. Is that right? Have you used different vendors throughout the history of that? We go out to bid typically every three years for a contract. So my understanding, Mr. Prince, is to get to your question, is there have been products developed by different vendors to um, for the use of this, this treatment? I'm sorry, so that was not the answer. Um, That's not the answer that I'm not I'd like to state that um, there is a quality and safety of fluoride additives. Um, it's a standard 60, and it's a program commissioned by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and that... Uh, that program um, is required to ensure that all the fluoride that you, that's used in community water fluoridation meets the uh, minimum standards of quality and safety. Is that what you were going to say, Doc? That's not responsible. Doc, is that what you were going to say? Is that what you were going to add to, sir? Well, you know, I, I think I, I would agree with that. Uh, maybe I could also add on to maybe address the idea of fluoride as a, as a byproduct or as a waste product. You know, it's really simple, and it sort of goes along with this idea of is fluoride poison or not poison or medication or not medication. It's, it's a lot of discussion about nothing, really. You know, sometimes when you dig in the ground, maybe you're looking for something like tin, you could dig up other things. Could be fluoride, could be a diamond, but it doesn't make that other product that you dig up uh, any less valuable or worthless or, or harmful in any other way. It's just a terminology. So uh, that's, I think it's important to point that out. I, I think I think a question a question I have is all the communities that fluoridate their water in the United States do they all use sodium fluoride do some use calcium fluoride is there a different type of chemical composition of fluoride that is used I think that's part of the fact finding we need to do um, in, in my opinion but does anybody else that, that's what I was anything getting. besides sodium fluoride yeah, that was probably the question I can answer, I can answer this really easily uh, in Alaska, we use sodium fluoride in our, in our small systems. And almost everywhere else in the U.S. Uh, use fluorosilic acid. It's called silly acid is the common name for it. Here in Alaska, transporting that silly acid is, is too dangerous. It, it's, it's very, very acidic. Uh, it's difficult to fly it around. I'm sorry. That's, uh, that's, 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 to me, that's scary it's right a, there. I, th I think we need some... We need some unbiased information, not using terms like dangerous to transport, because that tells me right away, why are we putting it in our water if it's dangerous to transport? But the there's, 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 there's no acid dangerous. fluoride in Alaska. Well, I think people, haven't people died from the ingestion of too much fluoride in Alaska? And if there's a few communities that over-fluoridated. There are communities, I think that, one that's, of our military that's, bases that's was fluoridated to the end of sometime in the last couple of years, and they were told not to drink their water for as many days as it took to get it out of the system. There are over-fluoridation issues due to the danger of, the, of this, the stuff we're putting in our water that we also need to be aware of in historically. And, and that's the question I was trying to get to here toward before the end of the testimony. Mr. Jager, if you just bear with me. The next question, and I had to be doctor, is, is, and perhaps, Hey, we can help identify as well, and perhaps Mr. Mr. Ritter, if you've been doing the study with environmental health and the water systems. My understanding is we have had instances, as Ms. Drummond said, of over fluoridation where it's caused a concern for public health. Are you aware of what those issues were? I understand 
uh, anecdotally through Bayou, the short conversation I had was to understand how it got to that point where they believe, but they don't know because they weren't part of the investigation. Did you, did the public health department of the state identify or identify uh, causations and or uh, what caused the health condition to develop? Well, the health condition was the same as the other one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And Alaska is actually, we got various kinds of social health care, whether it's with Native corporations or uh, the, uh, I can't remember what his name, the child care kind of thing. Couldn't we switch off of a water uh, fluoridation and go for a more targeted direct action of identifying those that have the tooth decay issues and give them uh, fluoridated toothpaste or fluoride bottles uh, as part of the whole healthcare system that we're now going to start the institute in the next two years and so far down the line. Could we sort of change the way that we do the process? So I, and I, I guess this is a question that might be a suggestion of a yes. solution. I think. So I'm going to I'm going to note that, sir. I appreciate your comment. <coughs> Yeah, Just the doctor was correct. I was out there at J Bear when that incident happened. So we got the machinery and the contractors running the flooring system, putting it into the water system. They notified every man base immediately. There were no health problems. Just accommodation couldn't use the water. Did they follow up with monitoring people that might have health? We're not taking questions from the audience, man. All right. Um, we're coming to the end of a uh, time period allotted, and I do realize and know that we started a little later. I will uh, tell you that, as chair of the Public Safety Committee, to my colleagues, that um, I don't believe we're done with this matter in particular, and, and as a reason I state that is the uh, investment given by members, concerned members of the community. Uh, I'm very thankful that you, uh, Mr. Agri, I, I'm going to just recognize you momentarily, uh, your repeated uh, uh, appearances before uh, the assembly. Uh, to bring this topic up. Um, Ms. Drummond and Ms. Elder Jackson, I know, have asked me on repeated to Ms. Drummond in particular, uh, can we schedule this for the Public Safety Committee? And, and I'm sorry that it has taken so long to get here, but of course, have many other matters that we have to address. Ms. Single, well, thank you for your uh, patience as well. I know that uh, this is something that we've had discussions on. Um, and of course, with the utility, I appreciate your appearance. I understand it was a board meeting today, otherwise, you might have a few other folks in attendance, but uh, very capable of the today, and I appreciate it. Uh, sir, I appreciate your uh, comments, and, and I, I want to just address briefly one of the concerns raised. One of the reasons that we have midday meetings is, believe me, um, and it drives the clerk's office nuts. I have had meetings different times of the day, different weeks of the month, at different locations. It drives them nuts. They want consistency. They want so the public knows when, second Wednesday, noon, at the, you know, where am and, and stick to it. It's, it's uh, something that drives me. actually changed. Excuse me? I, I was on, when I left the assembly, I was under the impression it was the 13th until two days ago. I understand. So. And, and, and that's, that was my error, and I apologize for that. And I will tell you that I've addressed many meetings, many meetings, um, and I'm willing to meet anytime, anywhere. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I found that, look at here, at noon, at noon today, we've got a, a pretty good size number of turnout on one issue. We, we normally have two or three matters that draws significantly smaller crowds. So I will tell you that I think the public is fairly well represented here, and I appreciate your uh, your passion to it. Mr. Train, had a comment. Another problem, your comment earlier, we, a lot of times we have a hearing on something Tuesday night, and people complain, why did you have a meeting at night? I can get off late any time. So what we get is we get both sides of any question we have. I've done this for about 14 years, and I've heard from people that we want to meet in the daytime, I've heard from people we don't want to meet at night. There's no way you can make everybody happy, sir. So we, we do the best to accommodate, and believe me, we'll have a, a further conversation on the matter. Mr. Chair? And, sir, I, you had one comment I, I said. Want, yes. Just, can I give us a few seconds? Yes, you please. Just please. Actually, uh, about this, it's, a, it's a chart about 50 gate trends for coordinated versus uncoordinated countries. Okay, so, very good. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. I have a recorded message from Dr. Walsh. He's a dentist here in the channel. How long is the message? Uh, 45 seconds. Okay, bring it up here, Mr. I, I will assure you that we'll be ending the meeting shortly, and if there's any uh, sidebar conversations, you can contact any one of the assembly members. Uh, you don't have to go through this committee to do it, but I will be issuing a report of our uh, uh, meeting for today and schedule likely a follow-up conversation, sir, before we go. Sir? So, uh, I put my name on the list. Oh. It was not called. Uh, I'm sorry, you're Dr. Thomas? Yeah, I am Dr. Thomas. Okay. I've gone to you a couple times, I'm sorry. Well, okay, I thought, I just said I was not uh, speaking on behalf of CDC or in or yes. the last native. I worked for the last native tribe health consortium. I just wanted to get it on record. Yes, so please. I, uh, um, I'm a doctor. Uh, I'm living, I've lived here in Anchorage for a number of years. I've also worked out in uh, rural Alaska, and I uh, support the uh, continued uh, optimal fluoridation of the Anchorage water supply. 
it sounds like there's a lot of concerns about the toxicity of fluoride. And I, I hope you understand that fluoride is diluted before it gets put in the water. It may come in a concentrated form that is labeled, you know, corrosion, that toxin. And so these are the issues that uh, Mr. Ritter has raised. And, and when he says that uh, our version of it is too acidic and therefore dangerous, it ultimately gets diluted uh, so that it, it's safe to put in the water. Um, I want to reiterate that it, 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 uh, um, we should not overlook the fact that, that in many parts of the world, and including the US, fluoride occurs naturally in the water. And uh, as, as uh, um, <coughs> Dr. Hilbert has, has stated, that uh, it's, 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 uh, it was noted that in areas where people had water naturally in the fluoride, their teeth were uh, uh, much more resistant to decay. Um, I would challenge those that state that uh, one third of the children uh, in areas with fluoridated water have uh, stained teeth and fluorosis. I would actually like to see those children presented here because I, I mentioned to say that, as Dr. Willard has said, it's very hard to detect uh, that. And so these are sort of outlandish claims that say that 30% of children in fluoridated uh, areas have fluorosis. Um, uh, I would also uh, challenge those who um, uh, uh, post fluoridation to, to visit areas where water is not fluoridated and see the con in Alaska and see the condition of children's teeth. Understanding your issues and your comments around soda, the CDC study uh, indicated even controlling for soda in villages without fluoridation uh, have much worse tooth decay than villages with fluoridation. My second point has to do with, and I'll be brief, sorry, but I just didn't get to, I was in the hospital to talk about. has to do with, with science. And uh, so as ever, you know, many people have mentioned that there's been well-conducted studies over the last 60 years consistently indicating that fluoridation from community waters is safe and effective in preventing death and decay. And it is the most efficient way to prevent one of the most common childhood diseases, that being tooth decay. Those that oppose fluoridation may be hard pressed to come up with well conducted, peer reviewed scientific studies uh, that show that there is a detrimental effect to putting fluoride in water. I would say that information that comes from the internet, emails, newsletters, and anecdotes do not qualify as valid, as valid references. Uh, anyone can say on the internet, uh, and, and those uh, opposed to fluoridation have done so. They've charged that water fluoridation uh, causes, uh, you've heard some of the number of diseases that have been mentioned. Uh, others include AIDS, uh, I've done a lot of HIV work. Uh, it was not caused by fluoridation in the water. Um, Alzheimer's, cancers, lead poisoning. The list goes on and on of things that uh, have been attributed to fluoridation. Uh, and none of it can be substantiated, uh, substantiated in the scientific literature. My final comment, I just urge the panel to look at the science and not be swayed by vocal and threatening statements. I would urge the panel, there are, there are various documents. The ADA has put this document out. It's a very useful, very readable document called Fluoridation Facts, put out by the ADA. Hopefully we can get a copy of this to all members of the panel and the assembly, if they agree. And uh, <coughs> if the ADA is advocating fluoride, it seems to me that they are not, uh, they don't stand, they don't necessarily stand with gain by right? advocating for fluoride. As the doctor here stated, he's in the business of making money out of decayed tea. But he's here, he's here to promote the use of fluoride. Thank you very much. Okay, um, let's, let's hear this statement. This is Dr. Walsh. Um, I'm going to in Anchorage? In Anchorage, yes. Um, his office specializes in dental care and with the understanding of how it affects the entire person.
bet you until uh, late. You can uh, feel free to quote me to uh, uh, as being opposed to one foundation for a number of reasons. Uh, freedom of choice would be one, uh, informed consent, and uh, that it never has been proven on a long-term basis in all the longitudinal studies that I've read that it has a, uh, a beneficial effect, plus all of the health problems that are associated with it. So you can feel free to use my name and make those uh, comments. Thank you very much. Okay, so I, I want to point out, sir, you got a comment? One minute. Yes. I'm Dr. Don Kovaleski. I'm a village dentist I've for the last 30 years. We're on Lake Ilion. I'm also the dental director for the largest village in Alaska, Anchorage. We have two full-time operating rooms that just do kids less than five years old. We have 200 kids on the waiting list to get into those operating rooms for the devastation of dental decay. On average, 40 to 50 patients present to our dental emergency room per day. That's all related to dental decay. If you decide to remove fluoride from the water, that will definitely increase our load. As you can see, how it is. It's a right now. So your position is fluoride. Okay, so we're just beyond the time uh, scheduled to begin recognizing we started just a tad late. So I will close with this. Recognizing and balancing as a legislative body, not speaking for my colleagues, again, you can address to any assembly person, your representative, or any and all of us uh, on the internet, and I'm not sure the actual address, it's like exclamation point MAS, gets to all assembly persons if you want to do it in one um, shot. If you want to talk to your representative, that's fine. We would love to have information about this issue or of course, if it's unrelated to this issue, uh, make sure that's indicated on the you know, reference line. Um, anything concerning the legislative body of the municipality of Anchorage, of course, that's our responsibility. Uh, and I recognize, again, the subject matter experts are here, and I appreciate uh, documents. Uh, I see the book that you had referenced with the ADA, Dr. Thomas. Uh, I see a book in the front here, if you want to hold it up, that says something about a case of fluoride or something like that, the case about fluoride. So there's gonna be documentation, um, on both sides of the matter, and I, I appreciate, fully appreciate, uh, scientific, peer-driven, substantiated, documented, verified, and vetted, rather than just, I mean, I can write a lot about my own personal life experiences, uh, and one of the things that I'm dying to know is does, as you get older, do teeth actually become more hardened and less prone to teeth tooth decay, like cavities? Uh, then there's the, the do doctor over here who said his aunt, who had no cavities at all, lost all her teeth to periodontal disease. I mean over brushing hard, hard bristles versus soft bristles. And over, I mean, there's a, a gentleman, Mr. Dudley, who comes and talks about the oscillating little machines that are really uh, damaging to the tissues in your gums. Um, apparently, he has sensitive gums as a result of it. So there's a lot of things, and I recognize uh, uh, the uh, public health director uh, for the state, uh, Dr. Herbert Dudd, uh, in the identified asked and Tylenol, other substances that are out there that if you take. And all of that, sir, I understand, and Ms. Drummond's correct. Those who come with labels and you put that in individually. Uh, we're talking the public's concern about the government, its government, placing a substance into its drinking water. And it's a concern enough that it, it is a topic that needs to be publicly discussed, thoroughly investigated, fact found as best we can to make informed decisions as policymakers. And I want to just throw it right back onto the public. If your legislative body isn't doing it for you, if you don't believe that it's the decision we should make that there's also ballot initiatives that can be placed on our ballot as a process. I encourage you to look into it. Uh, I, I would ask, and I think it was stated, stated it more than once, I would ask that you be very cautious that we take this. You know, government's a slow moving animal. Yeah, we can we can institute a law on any given Tuesday night, but typically there's unintended consequences if we go too fast and we miss a few things. And I know Mr. Trainer can speak with years of experience. We've got to go back and amend it. So consider our laws like a big piece of silly putty that just keeps getting shaped and reshaped. And uh, that's the approach I take. So I appreciate the deliberate discussion. I appreciate the respectfulness of the, and the dialogue from within, within the community and it's concerned citizens and subject matter experts as well as the subject matter experts within the medical profession as well as the agencies and organizations. Uh, so with that, I, I say stand by. We will, we've not heard the, the last of this, I am sure. Uh, but I want to make sure we have a thorough and very uh, thorough process 
uh, two hours. This is probably as long as we've ever had on any one subject, Mr. Avery. So I wanted you to know that we've had this. And saying, well, thank you again for the health department. They will appreciate it. Please, if you have any documentation, you would get to us uh, through this process. As Kate is at the front, make sure we have your email. Uh, we can send it out as a reminder. I know that some of you are involved in other products. We'll get to you the next week or so. It's not a problem. Please get it to us as soon as you can. And with that, uh, it is now 2.10 and we're off record end of the committee. What do you say? What do you say?